All right, let's go over the three-question warm-up for Farm Basics 2. First question, what are the endogenous agonists to the different opioid receptors? So at the mu receptor, the agonist is beta endorphin. At the delta receptor, the agonist is enkephalin. And at the kappa receptor, it's dynorphin. Next, a patient comes to your office, and before you notice any other symptoms, you see that the patient's uvula deviates to the right when she says ah. What neurological areas might be damaged in order for this abnormality to be seen? So rightward deviation of the uvula means that the muscles on the right palate are raising the palate, but the muscles of the left palate are not. So what innervates the left soft palate? Well, it's the left vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, and the left nucleus ambiguous. So damage to either of those areas could cause the uvula to deviate to the right. Now, above the nucleus ambiguous, the soft palate portion of the right motor cortex is controlling the uvula by sending projections to the nucleus ambiguous via the right cortical bulbar tract but the nucleus ambiguous is receiving projections from both sides of the cortex. So a lesion above the nucleus ambiguous won't necessarily cause the uvula to deviate. Next, what are the classic presenting symptoms of a syringomyelia? So a syrinx compresses the crossing spinothalamic tract fibers at the anterior white commissure. And because of this, you can get bilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation in the upper extremities. And then rarely, you can compress the motor neurons in the anterior horn and cause some hand muscle weakness as well. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's move on to the lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Step 1 video. Students, I've been teaching in front of the camera for some time now, and though it's a little embarrassing, I do have a fan or two. Now, many of them say to me, Dr. Lewis, you should really be an actor. Get up in front of the big screen and really get famous. But I tell them, look, I'm dedicated to teaching now. And anyway, I've already been down that path. Remember a little movie called, I don't know, Star Wars? Yeah, who do you think played Darth Vader? <laughs> And what was the name of that film? 2001 A Space Odyssey? You remember a certain supercomputer named Hal? I'm sorry, Dave. And then, who could forget that groundbreaking comedy, The Cosby Show? Who was it that played that adorable but hilarious role of Rudy Huxtable? Putin Pops. I don't like the name names. So, students, I appreciate the feedback, but as you can see, I've already lived the life of a Hollywood superstar. Now, it's time to make you superstars. All right. Let's move on. So in the last lecture, we went over what happens when you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. We also talked about how a few drugs that we use clinically uh, uh, attack that pathway as well. But now we need to focus on inhibiting the parasympathetic nervous system. And though it doesn't seem that complicated, students do get a bit tripped up here. We've said previously that the autonomic nervous system is a balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. But inhibiting the parasympathetic nervous system is not the same thing as stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. There is a difference between the two. In the last lecture, we filled out a table that listed the effects of stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system, but let's review that very quickly so that we can predict what happens when we inhibit that stimulation. So here we go down the list. Remember in the lung, we're going to see smooth muscle contraction. Remember, this is with stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. With the GI tract, you're going to see increased muscle motility and tone, more digestion and transit through the intestines. Remember, we talked about the parasympathetic nervous system being rest and digest. Salivary glands, you're going to get copious watery secretions. and the heart, you're going to get decreased heart rate and some decreased contractility. In the eyes, we're going to see meiosis. Remember, we're going to see that constriction of the pupil, contraction of the ciliary muscle that's going to lead to accommodation. In the lacrimal glands, you're going to see a lot of tear stimulation there. Uh, in the bladder, you're going to get uh, wall con uh, contraction and uh, relaxation of the sphincter. In the uterus, you're going to have contractions. And in the penis, remember, we're going to have that erection because remember our pneumonic point and shoot point going with parasympathetic. And in the clitoris, you get the same type of thing in, in the penis as well. You get engorgement. So let's go ahead and look in the study guide. What are the symptoms of inhibiting parasympathetic activity? So this is the opposite now. So also instead of saying uh, parasympathetic inhibition, a question might ask you about maybe anticholinergic or maybe anti-muscarinic effects. And that makes sense because we went over in the last lecture uh, the parasympathetic nervous system and it's using acetylcholine as its major neurotransmitter. And then it's going to use muscarinic receptors that are going to be located on the effector organs. So if we're blocking the effects of acetylcholine, then we refer to this as anticholinergic. Now if something is anti-muscarinic, then it's not necessarily anticholinergic. It's simply blocking the muscarinic receptors and perhaps not affecting acetylcholine at all. However, when we're referring to the symptoms of inhibiting all three of these, the answer is generally going to be the same. Though technically not the same, anti-muscarinic and anticholinergic are often used interchangeably.
Now, in the real world, we tend to use the term anticholinergic effects a bit more often than we say things like that has an anti-muscarinic effect or a parasympathetic inhibition effect. So let's go back to our question here. What's the answer to our question? Recall that stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system caused everything to become leaky. Remember old McDonald that we had in our MCQ breakdown who started to drool because of organophosphate poisoning. Well, if we inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system, then we dry everything up. So many uh, of you might know this great uh, memory tool, this mnemonic that we've used for a long time. Hot as a hair, red as a beet, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, mad as a hatter, and bloated as a toad. So hot as a hair is referring to the hyperpyrexia that can take place because you're not sweating as much. And this can be a little confusing because sweating is actually mostly controlled by the sympathetic nervous system, but the sweat glands are innervated with muscarinic receptors. So that's why you see this occurring with anticholinergic activity. Now people will have flushing, which also accounts for that red as a beat. Blind as a bat occurs because blocking parasympathetic activity will cause psychoplegia and medriasis. Therefore, patients will lose the ability to accommodate. Patients will be dry as a bone because they won't be salivating as much. Next is mad as a hatter. So acetylcholine is an important neurotransmitter in the brain as well as in the periphery. Therefore, you can actually see things like delirium when you inhibit it. Bloated as a toad is referring to constipation and urinary retention. So you're not digesting quickly, you're slowing all that down. Now another symptom we see that doesn't fit into that memory tool is tachycardia. So the vagus nerve, which is the major parasympathetic nerve in the body, helps to slow down the heart. Uh, therefore, if you inhibit it, then you may get tachycardia. So what drugs inhibit parasympathetic activity? So let's go through the muscarinic antagonists. So, and then what are their uses? So the prototypical muscarinic antagonist is atropine. So atropine will have many of the effects that we just described. Clinically, it's used to treat bradycardia. In the past, it was used to dilate the pupil. It's not used that much anymore because we have newer drugs that don't last as long. People generally don't want to be dilated all day long. Now, we mentioned in our last lecture that atropine is still used to treat organophosphate poisoning. Now, what was the other medication that we used in organophosphate poisoning? Remember, that was pralidoxine. Pralidoxine was acting to regenerate acetylcholinesterase, which will break down all that excess acetylcholine in the, in the synaptic cleft. But atropine uh, was also used uh, for things like enuresis in children. But again, we have better drugs for this now, so we don't do that as much. Now, other muscarinic drugs include uh, homotropine, uh, uh, picamide, uh, cyclopentylate, these are used topically most of the time, and these are used to dilate the pupil. They have a much shorter duration than atropine, therefore they are used much more often. Benztropine is used to help treat Parkinson's disease, uh, and that's also used to help the side effects of some of the antipsychotic medications, so we'll be taking those at the same time. Scopolamine is used as a patch that you actually put behind your ear, helps with motion sickness. It's also uh, helpful to decrease oral secretions, which can be used in patients who are uh, mechanically ventilated or for, pa or for patients who maybe can't clear their secretions very well. Ipratropium and teotropium uh, are inhaled drugs that can be used in asthma and in COPD. They help decrease bronchoconstriction, and that can help open up the airways. Oxybutynin is used to decrease overactive bladder symptoms. And this brings us to another uh, uh, study guide question. What anticholinergics are used in the treatment of urge type urinary incontinence? So the answer here is oxybutynin, tolteridine, darfinacin, solafinacin, and trospium. Now, uh, one student mnemonic that we've had over the years that, uh, that it seems to be really nice here is drugs that treat urge incontinence. You gotta think about uh, the uh, mnemonic on the darn toilet. So on stands for oxybutynin, the stands for tolteridine, darn uh, st uh, stands for darfinacin, and then the toilet is trospium. So that's a good way to remember that. Okay, well since pharmacology is such a tough part of step one, let's go over what we just learned in the Lewis Notes. Okay, everybody, welcome to another Lewis Notes. We're looking at our muscarinic antagonist, and here we're doing our matching game again. We're just gonna try to put uh, the clinical uses to the muscarinic antagonist. So the first one we have here is urge incontinence. Which drug did that? Remember, that's gonna be our oxybutynin. So we'll put that urge incontinence over here. Bronchodilator, you'll notice we have a couple of these. So uh, they have similar uh, endings. So ipatropium is one that's pretty easy. And you also think of teotropium, so put those two over there. Parkinson's disease, this one's always a little bit tricky, um, but you can use benztropin uh, in that one. Organophosphate poisoning, hopefully we remember this one. This is gonna be atropine. Also remember you can use a pralidoxine uh, for that as well. Uh, next up we have decreased airway secretions. So that one's a little bit tricky, uh, but you might wanna put that over here with scopolamine. So if you have an ICU patient who has a lot of secretions, you might use that to decrease that. Next, we have another urge incontinence. Which one is that? This one's a little bit harder to remember. This is darfinacin, another urge incontinence medication. 
Motion sickness. Oh, where's this going to go? Is it going to go on uh, tropicamide? No. Remember, this is a tricky one. This is scopolamine, and we use this in a little patch that we put behind the ear. And then to dilate the eye, that's where we're going to use our uh, tropicamide. Um, and that's going to help uh, be not quite as potent as atropine, which we used uh, many years ago. All right, guys, that's going to be the end of our Lewis notes. Okay, so next let's move on in the study guide. So what patient populations uh, is atropine contraindicated? Well, first we have patients with BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. So these pa patients already tend to have problems with urinary retention. So we don't want to make that worse because antimuscarinics can cause a hyperpyrexia. You also wouldn't want to use these type of medications with patients with hyperthermia. Now, a big one that you might be tested on is that you never want to give atropine uh, to a patient with acute angle glaucoma. Now recall that atropine causes cycloplegia and medriasis, and this can result in an increase in intraocular pressure. You also need to be careful using atropine in the elderly. Atropine can cause things like delirium. In fact, even less potent medications that have anticholinergic effects, like maybe just antihistamines, can lead to things like delirium in the elderly. Then finally, avoid using atropine in patients with GI obstruction or ileus, because again, this will decrease GI uh, path, path through, uh, and then you don't want to make that worse. All right, so those are the major contraindications, but also realize that other medications can have anticholinergic effects as well. So look again in the study guide. What medications have anticholinergic side effects? So we just talked about one, the first generation H1 blockers, so diphenhydramine, doxalamine, and uh, chlorpheniramine. Those medications, though they're over the counter, can still cause a lot of problems. Neuroleptic drugs, so antipsychotics, especially uh, thyridazine, uh, chlorpromazine, clozapine, olanzapine, all those medications. Also think of the tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, almost every patient I've ever had on a tricyclic complains of dry mouth. And then amantadine is another one you need to uh, look out for as well. Test makers love to make questions where an elderly patient presents an acute delirium and they need to be on the lookout for drugs with anticholinergic effects. So an example would be an elderly patient that started taking diphenhydramine for allergy symptoms and then started acting goofy. All right guys, so now we've made it to the end of the lecture. It's time for that end of session quiz. So try to answer those questions then we'll go through them together. First question here, identify the following drugs as a direct cholinergic agonist, an anticholinesterase, an anti-muscarinic, or a cholinesterase regenerator. So knowing all these drugs is incredibly important for your step one uh, exam. Uh, the question might describe a patient with specific side effects, and then your answer choices will be the drugs, and you have to know which drug is going to fall into which category. So definitely, definitely, definitely very high yield to know all of these drugs. Now this is a huge topic, commonly overlooked by a lot of medical students. Be sure to know these. And some of these answers we actually uh, covered in the last lecture, so we're going to put all this together. So the first one we have here is physostigmine. Remember, that's going to be an anticholinesterase. Pilocarpine is a direct muscarinic agonist. Oxybutynin, that's going to be a muscarinic antagonist and it's used for urge incontinence. Atropine, remember, is going to be our muscarinic antagonist again. Donepazil is an anticholinesterase. Prelidoxine, this is going to be our one regenerator of acetylcholinesterase. Remember, we use that for organophosphate poisoning. Bethanacol has col in it, uh, so you know that it's going to be a cholinergic agonist. Neostigmine is an anticholinesterase. Darfinicin, muscarinic antagonist. Ipratropium, another muscarinic antagonist. We use it in our COPD. Tropicamide is another muscarinic antagonist. Benztropine, another muscarinic antagonist. Remember, we're going to use that in a lot of our uh, um, psychotic patients to decrease the side effects of the antipsychotic medications. Scopolamine, another muscarinic antagonist used for seasickness. Edrophonium is an anticholinesterase. Tolteridine is a muscarinic antagonist, and it's used for urge incontinence again. Trospium, muscarinic antagonist, used again for urge incontinence. Rivastigmine, that's going to be an anticholinesterase, and that's used for Alzheimer's disease. Homotropine is a muscarinic antagonist. Pyridostigmine is an anticholinesterase. And then Carbacol here is a cholinergic agonist. All right, next question. Which of the muscarinic antagonists discussed could be used to improve FEV1 in a patient with COPD? So two medicines that we described were the ipotropium and the teotropium. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of Farm Basics 2. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.